Mm-hmm. So a couple of days ago, I made a TikTok about how me growing up as a black man, I've realized that I am, I guess, more threatening to white England, white world in general. And I'm just reading up some criticisms and theory for university. And look at what I found that links to how that full process links to history. This combination of violence and sexuality made black men inherently unsuitable for work until they were trained by white men and placed under their discipline and control. To explain these relations, white elites created the controlling image of the buck. Unlike images of African natives who roamed their wild homelands like beasts untamed by civilization, colonialism, the representations of the buck described a human animal that had achieved partial domestication through slavery. If we try to seem less threatening, we're damned. If we simply exist, we're damned. Either way, we are damned unless we do something. What something is, I'm not sure, but definitely being aware of these issues is a start. Before I get into what that something could be, it's important that we define a buck in its historical context. According to popular stereotypes during the post-reconstruction era, black bucks are seen as black men that are usually muscular or tall who defies white will and largely destructive to American society. Now, I would argue the entire concept of being a black buck is structured through the white gaze. One can argue the entire Western society see melanated men or men of African descent as being hot-tempered, excessively violent, unintelligent, and sexually attracted to white women. In my opinion, the something that we have to do is reimagine black masculinity outside of the white gaze. I know I'm a little country, so that Texas draw might be strong. I'm saying gaze, G-A-Z-E. The white gaze is a term that was popularized by a critically acclaimed Toni Morrison. When she described how it operates, Toni Morrison said the white gaze is the idea that black lives have no meaning and no depth without the gaze. In the simplest terms, the white gaze can be conceptualized as the assumed white reader. When writers craft stories in assumed white, the often cisgender heterosexual male audience, they are writing for the white gaze in action. The white gaze can be expanded to mean in ways in which whiteness dominates how we think and operate within society. Being real, this specific gaze is so insidious and so impactful, it forces our own people to internalize it and us black men see other black men as being bucks. In my opinion, in order for us to have that I and I and reimagine masculinity, we have to have a knowledge of self. Self-love, self-care, self-awareness, self-discipline, knowledge of self. And in sculpting this knowledge of self, we have to recognize that the way that we define our manhood cannot be defined in how we dominate other people. Especially people in our communities. May it be non-gender conforming people or black women. The Huey P. Newton, one of the co-founders of the Black Panther Party, said that power is the ability to define the phenomenon and make it act in a desired manner. And when it comes to defining the phenomenon of black masculinity or black manhood, we have to do it with tenacity. Two things can be true at the same time. I can sit around and critique how toxic masculinity operates in my community while also acknowledging that toxic masculinity does not define what black men are. My manhood is not defined by the small confines of masculinity. Black masculinity. Author Rache Richardson argues that we underestimate the South's influence on the national understandings of black masculinity. She got intersectional with it too, talking about race, region, and gender. Trying to state it plainly, there is many complexities for how black masculinity is configured in this country. Or how Rochelle Richardson puts it, many negative stereotypes of black men, often contradictory ones, have emerged from ongoing historical traumas initiated by slavery. Are black men emasculated and submissive or hypersexed and violent? We could be seen as passive, docile, and not caring about anything in the world, while also being seen as hyper-masculine, always already angry, and having too much care about things that are meaningless. You know, usually I talk about how this binary of being seen as ratchet versus respectable is put on to black women, but I would also argue this is placed on to black men, but just with different uniqueness. Nostalgic representations of black men have arisen as well. Think of the philosophical, hardworking sharecropper or the abiding, upright preacher. We can just suppose that to the other black man trope, the gangster, the thug, the toxic masculine, hypersexual, can't control his thing in his pants, always looking to make some baby mamas type thing. And this is where author Rache Richardson starts to connect the dots from Uncle Tom to gangster. Starting with well-known carpenters as the Uncle Tom and the black rapist, Richardson investigates the range of pathologies of black masculinity that derive ideological force from their association within the South. You know, education is elevation and we should definitely explore black masculinity from an intellectual lens. Military policy, black liberation discourse, contemporary rap, she argues, are just some of the instruments by which egregious pathologies of black masculinity in Southern history have been sustained. I was reading this article about black masculinity in the United States, right? In this article, it said that many black men self-identify as protectors of their community, among other identities, gendered and otherwise. This protective trope of black masculinity is enforced through social rules such as black men don't get to get emotional in public, humorously captured on ABC's Blackie. 
when co-workers discuss what black men do instead of crying when they're emotional in public this trope also appearing through the social media trend protect black women hashtag i was intrigued by this part right here it says creating conflicted expectations of the place and role of black men in their nation and to themselves we are seen as both protectors of our community and being unequipped to protect ourselves despite these contradicting social inputs black men have not abandoned their role of community protectors many choose to take their responsibility and refuse to submit the circumstances of vulnerability despite grossly unequitable resources to be able to do such. I recognize when it comes to many of the videos that I make, a lot of people don't think that I have complexity when it comes to how I see myself and other black men. I know that black masculinity is peculiarly placed in this country, you feel me? The same people that roof us when we slam and touchdowns or dunks is the same people that'll criminalize us and justify our death. In conclusion, as a black man, I'm conscious about how power and privilege works in our community when it comes to us. And I believe with every fiber in our body that if some of us is free, then none of us is free. And that's the reason why my content is always centered around intersectionality, accounting for all of our liberations. You see what I'm saying? And recognize.